We've now finished all the math we need for this course. Now it's time to apply it to programming. But before we can write a program, we have to think a lot about what the program is for. Maybe we have to talk to a lot of people and find out what their needs are. And they might not agree with each other. Even one person might have conflicting goals, and you can't satisfy all of them. Sorting all this out is called requirements engineering. It's a great subject, and if you get the chance, you should take a course on it. The end product of requirements engineering is a specification, and that's our starting point. Well, what's a specification? We can specify anything. Cars, food, anything. And we do, all the time. Suppose I want you to go out and buy me a table, let's say. So I tell you, it should be wood, it should be brown, the height must be between 70 and 80 centimeters. What I'm telling you is a binary expression. The variables are the color, the height, whatever characteristics I'm interested in. Color equals brown and 70 centimeters less than or equal to height less than 80 centimeters and so on. Whenever you see a table it instantiates the binary expression. It provides values for the variables so you can evaluate the expression. And if you get true, you buy it. And if you get false, you keep on looking. And that's why we had to review binary theory. Okay, what are we specifying in this course? You might think it's programs. And we could specify programs. I could say, I want it to be in Java. I want it to be no more than 20 pages long. And I don't want that stupid format that puts the left brackets way over on the right and the right brackets on the left. I want the brackets lined up nicely, or, or whatever. But that's not the kind of specification you get from requirements engineering. We're not specifying what the program looks like. We're specifying what the screen looks like during execution. What the outputs are for each input. What kind of performance we want. In other words, we're specifying the computer behavior that we want. How the computer behaves when executing the program. A computer has a memory and the memory has some contents called the state or state of memory. So the memory is also called the state space. For example, the state space might be this, which is a memory that can hold an integer followed by an integer in the range 0 to 20 followed by a character, followed by a rational number. And here's an example of a state of that memory. At the beginning of a computation, the state is called the pre-state, and at the end it's called the post-state. Or we could say initial and final state. And we use the Greek letter sigma for the pre-state and sigma prime for the post-state. The little example memory has four addresses, so in the initial state the memory contents are sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 and in the final state they are sigma prime zero and so on. Referring to memory contents by address is very low level, so instead we talk about state variables, which just means giving names to each item of the state, like maybe i, n, c, and x. And we just use those same names for the initial values of the state variables and primed versions for the final values. So a state variable, like i, which is really a memory location, is two mathematical variables, i and i prime. And these are the variables that our specifications talk about. They are the non-local variables of our specifications. We could specify lots of other things about computations, and we will later. We will talk about execution time, and space requirements, and interactions and communications. By the way, termination means the execution time is finite, and non-termination means the execution time is infinite. 
So termination and non-termination are timing issues, and we'll get to them later. But we're going to start out very simply, just talking about the pre-state and the post-state, not about timing, so not about termination. For now, a low-level specification of computer behavior is a binary expression in variables sigma and sigma prime. We provide a pre-state, sigma, as input. The computer makes a computation that satisfies a specification by creating a satisfactory post-state as output. That means the pre-state and post-state must make the specification true. Now, the same again, but high level. A specification is a binary expression in unprimed and primed state variables. We provide values for the unprimed variables as input. The computer provides values for the primed variables as output, so that all values together make the specification true. Here's some terminology about specifications all about how many satisfactory post states there are. Specification S is unsatisfiable for pre-state sigma means the number of satisfactory final states is zero. And it's satisfiable if there's at least one satisfactory final state. The same specification could be unsatisfiable for one initial state and satisfiable for another initial state. A specification is deterministic for some initial state if there's at most one satisfactory final state. And it's non-deterministic if there's more than one satisfactory final state. An equivalent way to define satisfiable for a pre-state is there exists a satisfactory post-state. The most important definition on this page is implementability. A specification is implementable means for all pre-states there exists a post-state to satisfy the specification. The pre-states are input so the computer has no control over that. We could provide any pre-state and the computer has to provide a post-state as output to satisfy the specification. So for each input there must be at least one satisfactory output. If not, there's no way a computer can provide one, so the specification is unimplementable. Let's look at some examples. Suppose the state space is integer variable x and y. This example says, make the final value of x be one bigger than its initial value, and make the final value of y be the same as its initial value. It says, increase x by 1 and leave y unchanged. So whatever x and y we provide, the computer can make final values to satisfy this specification. It's implementable. And it's deterministic for all initial states because there's only one final state that satisfies the specification. If you're worried about overflow, don't. By integer variable, I mean integer variable, not 32-bit 2's complement. Of course, overflow is a problem on real computers, but it's one problem I'm leaving out of this course. That's because we'll have enough problems without it. Here's another specification. It says, make the final value of x be bigger than the initial value. It says increase x and I don't care what happens to y. It says that last part by not saying anything about y prime. It's implementable and it's non-deterministic because there are many choices for x prime and for y prime. One way to satisfy this specification is to add 1 to x and leave y unchanged. And there are many more ways to satisfy it. This specification is weaker than the first one, so it's easier to implement. 
the easiest specification to implement is true. All behavior satisfies it, so it doesn't matter what the computer does. It's implementable and non-deterministic. And the other extreme is false, which is not satisfied by anything. So it's unimplementable. Here's a specification that says that initially x is non-negative, and finally y is 0. If we supply, say, 3 as input for x, the computer has to set y to 0, and the specification is satisfied. If we supply minus 3 as input for x, then the specification is false no matter what the final values of x and y are. There's no way for the computer to satisfy the specification, so it's unimplementable. But maybe we never want to have a negative input. In that case, here's the specification we should write. If we supply 3 as input to x, then just like before, the computer has to set y to 0. We don't care what would happen if x were negative, because we're not going to give x a negative value. And that's what this specification says. It says, if x is negative, then anything is fine. This specification is implementable and non-deterministic. There are two specification notations that are really useful. One is OK, which means do nothing, leave everything alone. Using the low level state, that's sigma prime equals sigma. Using the high level state variables, that's x prime equals x and y prime equals y and so on, whatever the variables may be. The other useful notation is assignment. x is assigned e, or x gets e, or set x to e, where x is a state variable and e is any expression. For example, x gets x plus 1. Notice that the assignment symbol is colon equals, not just equals. Now I know that in some programming languages it's just an equal sign, and I know why too. The Fortran language was designed long ago in 1955 by John Backus, and he used an equal sign. And he told me that he regretted using the equal sign for assignment. Writing x equals x plus 1 is just stupid because x isn't equal to x plus 1, unless x is infinity. So, in 1958, when John was one of the designers of Algol, he and the others decided to use colon equals for assignment. And ever since then, all well-designed programming languages have used it, like Pascal and Ada and Modula and Turing and Eiffel and so on. Poorly designed languages have copied the Fortran mistake. In this class, never use just an equal sign for assignment. At the low level, it means sigma prime is the same as sigma, except at address x, the value is e. At the high level, it means x prime equals e, and y prime equals y, and so on, whatever the other variables are. For example, if the variables are just x and y, then x gets x plus 1 means x prime equals x plus 1 and y prime equals y. Assignment means the variable being assigned has the right final value and all other variables are unchanged. Don't forget that last part. One final example, with no new notations in it, is this one. I guess the only point here is that you can mix all the notations together any way you want. It says that if x and y are initially equal, then the final value of x is the sum of the initial value of x and 1, and the final value of y is unchanged. And if x and y are initially unequal, 
then their final values should add up to 3. That's non-deterministic because there's some choice of final values. If you have two specifications, S and R, dependent composition is a way of composing them into one specification, written S dot R. It describes sequential execution. First behave according to specifica specification S and then according to specification R. Its definition is there exists X double prime, Y double prime, and so on, whatever the state variables happen to be. Those double prime variables stand for the intermediate values of the variables in between execution of S and R. So the computation is described by S except that we replace its primed variables with double primed variables because the final values according to S are really the intermediate values. And then by R, but replace its unprimed variables with double primed variables because the intermediate values are the initial values for R. I think an example will help. And let's just have one integer state variable x. So first, either leave x alone or increase it by 1. And then again, either leave it alone or increase it by 1. Using the definition of dependent composition, there exists x double prime, and then we write the first specification, but everywhere there was a prime, we put a double prime, and then we change the dot to and. And then we write the second specification, but everywhere there was no prime, we put a double prime. Now, we distribute and over or. That means we take this and this, or with this and this, or with this and this, or with this and this. So we get a disjunction of four things. And one of the laws from the back of the book says we can distribute the exists to each of the disjuncts. Now, the hint says one-point law. If you look that up, you find that it comes in two versions, the existential version and the universal version, and we want the existential version, which says if you have exists and a variable, and then you have an equation with that variable, and it's conjoined to something, then you can get rid of the quantification and get rid of the equation and just write the rest down, but substituting for the variable. So, for the first disjunct says x prime equals x. The second one says x prime equals x plus 1. The next one says x prime equals x plus 1 again, and there's no need to write it again. And the last disjunct says x prime equals x plus 1 plus 1, which is x plus 2. So that's the resulting specification. It says either leave x alone or increase it by 1 or increase it by 2. Notice that the specification still just talks about the initial and final values, not about the intermediate values. Now let's look at a picture of it. The leftmost column says that either x stays the same or is increased by 1. That's being composed, see the dot, with the same thing again. The definition of independent composition says there's an intermediate state, and the final result shows that from 0 you can get to 0, or 1, or 2. Actually, to get from 0 to 1, there are two routes. 
but the final answer doesn't say anything about how many roots there are. Here's another example, this time using two integer variables x and y. x gets 3 and then y gets x plus y. x gets 3 means x prime equals 3 and y is unchanged. y gets x plus y means y prime equals x plus y and x is unchanged. The dependent composition means there exist intermediate values, x double prime and y double prime, of type int, which I often don't bother to write, but it really is there, such that, now change final values to intermediate values, so x double prime equals 3 and y double prime equals y, and now change initial values to intermediate values, so x prime equals x double prime and y prime equals x double prime plus y double prime. Now we can use one point twice because we have exists with two variables and each one has an equation. So leave out the exists, leave out the equations, and write the rest, but replace the double prime variables with what they're equal to. And so x ends up 3, and y ends up 3 plus the initial value of y. And that's exactly what you knew the assignment said. Here are some laws about specifications. The first one says that OK is both a left and right identity for dependent composition. If you do nothing, and then do p, it's the same as doing p. Also, if you do p and then do nothing, that's just doing p. The next one says that dependent composition is associative, so we won't bother to write parentheses. The next few laws are just laws of binary theory, but we can look at them again as specification laws. The first two are laws that programmers know. The first one says that if the then part and else part are the same, you might as well not have the if at all. And if you negate the if part, you switch the then part and else part. Then the case analysis laws which give two ways to rewrite an if. Now, there's a distributive law. Let me read it to you. If you do P or Q, and then you do R or S, that's the same as doing P and then R, or P and then S, or Q and then R, or Q and then S. And then a few more laws. They're all in the back of the book. But I want to pay special attention to the last one, the substitution law. It says, if you have an assignment followed by any specification, that's the same as that specification, but with a substitution. Replace x with e in p. Here are some examples of it. First, x gets y plus 1 and then y prime greater than x prime. So replace x by y plus 1 in y prime greater than x prime. But there is no x in y prime greater than x prime. There's x prime, but no x. So substitution does nothing. And the result is still y prime greater than x prime. That means the computer chooses any final values for x and y, such that y is greater than x. It could choose 3 for x and 5 for y. If it's going to do that, then there was no point at all to the assignment x gets y plus 1. The next example says increase x by 1, 
and then make the final values of both y and x be bigger than the initial value of x. Now, be careful. The initial value of x means initial for the second part. So that's after x is increased. Anyway, replace both occurrences of x with x plus 1, and the result is that the final values of y and x must be bigger than the initial value of x plus 1. In the next example, the only point is that when you replace x by y plus 1, you have to add parentheses so the precedence doesn't go wrong. And the point of the next example is that you replace only the non-local x, not the local x. So you get 1 is greater than or equal to 1, and that can be simplified. So the final result is that y has to be even in the end. In the next example, we're replacing x with y, and that x is non-local, so we do have to replace it. But we can't put a non-local y in a place where it would look local. So first we have to rename the local variable. Let's call it k. And now we can make the substitution. The next example says x gets 1 and then OK. The point here is that you don't say there's no x to be replaced. You have to realize that OK stands for x prime equals x and y prime equals y, assuming the variables are x and y in these examples. So there is an x to replace, and the result is x prime equals 1 and y prime equals y. The next example is really the same thing again. In the second assignment, the occurrence of x is not apparent. But if we rewrite it, we see the x, and then we replace it, and get x prime equals 1 and y prime equals 2 which is obviously the effect of those two assignments. There are still two more examples, so let's clear some space for them. In the next example, we have three assignments in a row. We just did the first two, but that's not the smart way to do this one. The smart way is to rewrite the last assignment like this and then use the substitution law for y gets 2 followed by the last part. So that's x prime equals x plus 2 and y prime equals 2. And then we use the substitution law again to get x prime equals 1 plus 2 and y prime equals 2. In a long string of assignments, it's best to work from right to left because that way you can keep using the substitution law. If you go in the other direction, you get the same answer, but it's more work, because you ha keep using existential quantifications. In the last example, there's only one assignment, so we may as well use the substitution law where we can, replacing x by 1 in the middle part. So we get x prime greater than 1, and we still have the last part. And there's nothing we can do but use the definition of dependent composition. Now we have exists x double prime and y double prime. The y double prime isn't actually used, so we can get rid of that. Good. Now, to use the one-point law, we need to see x double prime equals something. So that's easy to arrange. Now we replace x double prime with x prime minus 1 in the first conjunct. And then 
simplify to get x prime greater than 2. All of these examples were small and easy to see what's happening, but the same techniques work for large programs where it's not obvious what is being computed. And best of all, it's possible to write a program to do these kinds of calculations automatically. That's where we stop this lecture.